Hi, everybody. This is Crypto Rich working with you to get rich with crypto, filling our pockets with crypto profits. And in this video, I'm thrilled to have one of my financial gurus, somebody I learned a lot from when I first started out on this journey, finding out about real money. And I'm going to be interviewing him all about a form of real money that isn't cryptocurrency and it isn't gold. You'll find out what that third option is in a moment. Now, this is part one of a two part series that I'm doing with this particular guest. The first part is not about crypto, and the second part ties into the first part and is about crypto. Take the first step towards online privacy. Get NordVPN. Safety and security notice, please watch out for comments like this by scammers pretending to be me or other huge crypto YouTubers. Also, please follow me on bittube.video. You can also follow me on Odyssey. These are both censorship resistant platforms. And every now and then I am going to post a video which isn't going to be on YouTube. Find me on these platforms. Hey, David, thank you so much for making yourself available. Really, really appreciate it. You are the silver guru. Is that correct? Well, I use that as a moniker, and I don't take it real seriously, but I certainly have studied the silver market for a very long time. Yes, for a very, very long time. And I, when I first started inquiring into and looking at, you know, where does money come from? Who decides? And looking at fractional reserve banking, how it got created, I came across your interviews that you would do on YouTube or different podcasts and stuff about silver. And I learned a lot from those interviews that you did about silver. And what we're going to be talking about is silver as a form of money. Now, do you want to say why silver is a form of money? Ver and also drawing comparisons with gold, and because I normally cover cryptocurrencies, making reference to Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies versus silver. And in the background, we'll have versus trash currencies, fiat currencies that aren't worth anything really. <laughs> Sure, I could go on for probably hours with that, but I'll try to be succinct. Number one, I think the most important three words I can say to your audience is all fiat fails. So fiat currency is an unbacked you know, piece of paper, basically. Of course, now it's digital. And whenever there's been an unsound or unbacked currency, it's failed 100% of the time. So now what's most worrisome is that the entire planet is basically on a fiat system. There is no um, you know, gold or silver backed currency in existence anywhere on the planet. So if we have a track record of 100% failure and we're at the final stages of this Keynesian experiment or fiat, it's been done time and time and time again, we have a pretty good indication that it's going to fail. And because of that, you want to look for the alternative. And the alternative has been gold and silver. Now, silver is money. First of all, I wrote, and I don't even know if it's on the internet anymore, but my one of my earliest articles was titled, Is Silver Money? Question mark. Silver has been money for more uh, for as long or longer than gold. It's the first money mentioned in the Bible. And the word silver and the word money are synonymous in all the Romance languages. So in Spanish, Italian, French, all the Romance languages, the word silver and the word money are synonymous. So if I tell you I'm going to go to the bank and get some money in Mexico. I'm going to say, you know, vamos a bank, el banco por plata. And plata means silver. So I'm going to the bank for money. So if you tell someone uh, in those countries that silver isn't money, they wouldn't actually be able to comprehend that very well. Uh, so it is money and it is an industrial commodity. It's absolutely both. It's been disregarded as money for a very, very long time. There's an incident called the crime of 1873, where the banking establishment in the United States said only gold could be used as money. And that carried on for a few years, and then they put silver back on the docket. Uh, but it was to control. And they had all the gold, and they didn't have a lot of silver. And they saw it as a means of uh, basically taking care of those renegades out in the western part of the United States at the time, the miners and the farmers and the entrepreneurs, and they kept the uh, money back to gold. And that's what the uh, book, The Wizard of Oz, is all about. It's a huge written metaphor by Frank Baum about the yellow brick road, which is the gold brick road back to the Emerald City, which is a metaphor for the banking establishment with their green currency. And Dorothy had silver slippers 
in the actual book. And all she had to do was click her heels or click the silver together and return to Kansas, return to the heartland, return to the heart, become cognizant of the fact that the people can determine what money is. And of course, that gets into the uh, <clears throat> William Bryant uh, lecture about cross and gold and all that. So far, they've gone way down the rabbit hole. But the point is very simple. Silver's been money more places and used more transactions as money than, than gold ever has. And if you go back to the one of the initial uh, gold shows, one of the most prominent at the time, the New Orleans Gold Show, they had uh, one of the most uh, prominent Nobel Prize laureates talking as one of the speeches. And he said, silver is the money of monetary history, not gold, end quote. Right. OK. Well, I think I know why fiat currencies fail. But just for those that are watching that may not be that familiar or whatever, could you explain why it is they fail? And sure. how come gold and silver haven't failed in the same way? Yeah, it's two things. Really, it's, um, it's trust. So if you have a lot of something, uh, it's less valuable. So if we keep printing more and more, you know, British pounds, U.S. dollars, Aussie dollars, Canadian dollars, you know, Argentine pesos or whatever the currency is, the more you print, the less valuable it becomes. So it becomes worth less and worth less. And then finally, eventually becomes worthless. Now, when it goes from worthless to worthless is a progression. But from that point in time, which really can't be measured, but you can get an indication where it's buying less and buying less to where people don't trust it anymore. That's a psychological event. That is not a monetary event. It happens because of the monetary event. In other words, too much has been printed. But you cannot say once this much is printed, the people lose faith in it. You can't do that. You can print and print and print, and you can never forecast exactly when the, you know, enough people give up. They say, I would rather have a jar of peanut butter than a British pound. I would rather have a set of pencils that I don't even use. I like to write with pens, but that's the only thing left in the store I can buy for these British pounds. I'm going to buy those because I'd rather have those than this currency. Now, are we going to get to that point or not? I do not know. We always pretty much we always have in the past with any fiat currency. But since we have different currencies in the world, we have a global trade system. It's all most of it's all digital. There's very few people that trade with actual physical currency. And the central banks are aware, well aware of what I just stated. There will most likely be a reset, which we keep hearing that word over and over again, which means uh, a new monetary system. And it could be a new Bretton Woods where the powers that be get together and they determine that everyone goes digital. Your bank account is no longer valid in the form it is now. There will be no more ATM machines. There will be no more physical paper. It's all digital. It's on your wallet. And the transition is this. And you know, check your bank account. You have to get this on your phone and your account, your new account will be there. So these banks are talking about central bank digital currencies as a competitor to the cryptos that are already so prevalent, at least in the uh, most aware people. And this is a competitor to their monopoly. And right. so they see where direction the world's going. They can have a lot more control if they force everybody onto their brand of crypto and invalidate the others or put some type of restrictions or regulations on the cryptos that exist now. And I think that will happen. And so we're off on the crypto space. I'll let you ask the question because I could just go on. I have some thoughts about it, obviously. <laughs> no, thank you. No, I get it. It is when you increase the supply of something, it, you lower the value of it. So then as they're increasing the supply of pounds and dollars and euros, especially in, in terms of increased government spending everywhere, even by governments that prior to this episode were, you know, we talk of being fiscally responsible and cutting budgets and the stories that's all gone out of the windows, all printing, 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 printing. And I do agree that the path that they would like to lead us on is into a central bank digital currency. Uh, tied to a biometric ID. That's my yeah. personal yeah. opinion from what stuff I've looked at. And then along the way, they're going to uh, try and rubbish, destroy cryptocurrencies because they can't control them. They're decentralized. And I think private, privacy-focused cryptocurrencies will have a much larger, larger role to play, like Pirate Chain and Monero. But also, I think gold and particularly silver will also have a role to play because they are decentralized, peer-to-peer, local transactions they are the most 
<laughs> decentralized anonymous means of exchange. I mean, nothing's more private than me giving you a silver dollar or a Britannia or whatever yep. uh, for some transaction. It could be intellectual. It could be, you know, I want your uh, consultation for an hour. Here's, uh, you know, so many Britannias. I mean, this is the way it works. So I'm still a proponent of, you know, of the gold silver story. And I'm not opposed to cryptos. There's some I like more than others. I think you're right. I think the Moneros and the Pirate are probably the ones that you want to focus on longer term. In the interim, do whatever you want. I'll spit it out. My take on Bitcoin is it's too powerful to regulate out of existence. But the regulators are so powerful that they could do this. And I've been saying this in other interviews. Have your Bitcoin. But you can't get a mortgage with Bitcoin or pay a, you can't pay a mortgage with Bitcoin. You can't buy a car, you can't get a car loan with Bitcoin. You can't pay your utilities with Bitcoin. You can't go buy groceries with Bitcoin. So in other words, anything that's day-to-day -day living expenses for the average person, you can't use Bitcoin. But you could buy a Lamborghini with Bitcoin from someone that's a Bitcoin person, right? So that's right. a private transaction. So you couldn't buy get a car loan with Bitcoin. But if you had enough Bitcoin, you could buy a house or whatever. But anything that's got a loan attached to it, like the current system, the credit system that exists, you wouldn't be able to use Bitcoin. Of course, with all that said, and this is conjecture on my part, I've thought it through pretty carefully, doesn't mean I'm right, but there'll be a black market. So, yeah. so someone will be able to take your Bitcoin, exchange it into a fiat of your choice, you know, euro, pound, whatever you need, and you can make the transaction and do it on credit or whatever. Yeah. But, um, but that's the way I see it. So rather than say, oh, no, you can't have it, it's you just can't use it in a lot of circumstances. Yeah, I think, I think, I, I agree with you. I think that the fiat connection, the on-ramp and the off-ramp from fiat to Bitcoin will get regulated away. And then what we'll have is the emergence of a parallel economy, which will feature gold, silver, and uh, I imagine more so the privacy cryptocurrencies. I think so too. Yeah, okay. So, so in the way the world is shaping up right now, what role do you think silver could have? You know, is it not that I'm not asking you to give investment advice, but what's the utility or the value in someone getting a little bit of silver? Well, last in um, about 20 years ago, I was asked to write uh, for the book called Investing Rules. It's out of the UK. And in the book, Investing Rules, they find experts in all fields like mutual funds, real estate, partnerships stock picking, utilities, you name it, all kinds of categories. And they asked me to write the 10 rules of silver investing. So I did. So I wrote about, you know, silver in a very pithy way with these bullet points, 10 of them. And silver is the money of last resort. The first rule number one is no one wants to be a prophet of doom. But in the unlikely event of an all out financial crisis, silver will be the money of last resort, not gold. Because gold will have too much value per unit for day-to-day -day transactions, whereas silver will be modest enough to carry on with normal activity. So expanding on that briefly, I mean, you can buy a loaf of bread with a dime or maybe get 10 loaves of bread with a dime, or <clears throat> but you couldn't buy, you'd buy the bakery with a gold coin. So that's the idea. That's money cool. of last resort is always silver. It's and really if you go back to the beginning, instead of being a bimetallic standard, which is gold and silver, it was a trimetallic silver. Read David Copperfield. You know, it was copper. So many coppers equal to silver. So many silvers equal to gold. And that's actually the best system. But uh, you know, I digress, but made the point. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I got it. Now you said silver is an industrial commodity. My understanding after oil is the most. It's the second um, most industrial, most used industrial commodity. That's so can correct. We, yeah. Can you yeah, go? These are facts. Used, and then how how is it rolling out? You know, what are the what's going on in terms of its use as an industrial commodity, given the way the world is shaping up? Yeah. Well, oil I think needs a brief mention because it is the most important thing. There was actually a, a documentary. I think it was by the BBC, but I'm not sure. And someone gave me a DVD uh, in London, and I was flying home, and it was, um, who destroyed 
uh, who destroyed Britain or something like that. I forget the exact title. And it was about a currency collapse. <clears throat> so I played the DVD expecting it to be all about currency. So it's actually all about oil. And uh, again, it was a docudrama. But what it was was an investment bank was on the wrong side of the oil market. There was a war started in the Middle East and it started blowing up the oil fields. Well, this oil company was heavily short oil. And of course, it went through the roof with oil being destroyed. And during that documentary or docudrama it was fiction. Uh, the minister of finance from the UK gets on TV and he says this, and I can't do a British accent, so forgive me. I'll go and have a go. Have a go, Dave. He does. I'll give it a go. But he just, it's absolutely, these words never left me. He goes, well, everyone thinks that the world runs on finance, money, that sort of thing. But in reality, it runs on energy. Without energy, nothing happens. And for the most part, that means oil. And that never left me because he was exactly right. As much as we focus on money and our bank accounts and our investments and everything else, everyone thinks that money makes the world go round, but energy makes the world go round. You know, do a thought experiment. Turn off all gasoline, turn off all petrol stations, diesel and gas for one week on the entire planet and see how much gets done. Mm -hmm. No one gets to where you, you know, no one gets to work, no fields get plowed, no airplanes fly. No, no, no power is generated. A lot of it's, you know, some of it's coal, of course, but you get the idea. Energy is everything. So now that I've made that point, we'll come back into silver. Now, silver is the most technological green metal in existence currently. Anything electrical conducts electricity better than any element. It reflects light better than any element. And it conducts heat better than any element. And I could go as far as to say it may be one of the purest in resonance. And this is a bit of a conjecture, but silver bells. It's got a very interesting acoustic property as well that no one ever talks about. But since, you know, Tesla talks about if you want to know the universe, you know, think about, you know, frequency and vibration. So I'll just throw that in there. So in a high tech world, anything electrical or electronic requires silver. And that means the more technologically advanced we get, the more silver per capita or meaning per person that we use, the more there's a demand on silver, not for money just to keep into the society with your cell phone, your laptop, your DVD player, your flat screen TV, your membrane switch, your computer keyboard, all your automobile, anything that you touch. You cannot do anything in your life in the modern world. I'm not talking about, you know, people that, you know, the Aborigines or any natives in uh, South America or something like that, but anyone that's in the modern world, which is obviously 98% of the population, doesn't go through a day without touching silver probably 10 times without realizing. You know, getting in the car, getting in the subway, turning on the TV, logging onto the computer, you know, their cell phone, whatever. So silver is absolutely imperative. It's essential. It's the most essential element next to oil that exists. But it's basically taken for granted, just like oil is taken for granted a large part of the time. But as the supply starts to tighten because and the demand increases simultaneously, you could, and I think you will, get into a squeeze situation, which means the demand keeps increasing and the supply is stead steady or declining, which will force the price higher. Right. Okay. And and, and the, the the demand keeps increasing because of all the uses, especially with regards to electronics and stuff. And the because all, all the, the new surveillance tools that are going to be there, like these biometric ID cards, they're going to need chips. And I imagine that they use silver and gold in them. You know, is there is there enough silver available? Right now there is. Uh, I looked at the RFID tags um, some time ago. And I, you know, all I have to do is misplace a decimal by one. So you're off by a factor of 10. So the first time I did the arithmetic, I was wrong. And I'm pretty good at math. But uh, no, it will take a lot. Uh, but there's so little use per unit. It will have an effect. I mean, let's look at um, what's in the semiconductor space right now, okay? Now, if you look at semiconductors, there's 44 million ounces of silver used on an annual basis for semiconductors. But when you look at how much coins are minted, there's not there's close to 40 million ounces used in, let's say, the silver eagles in a really productive year. Um, silver maples, maybe half that much. So all the major mints in the world individually do not use as much silver as the semiconductor industry does. That's something to think about. Are we going to be using more or less semiconductors? Well, as you suggest, a lot more. 
So there's that demand. So just to go a step further, I did an interview with uh, Matthew uh, Watson for my mastermind. <clears throat> and he did a paper. He does several. He's very accomplished. On uh, really dives deep into uh, all the metals. Uh, but of course, I was focusing on silver. And he's forecasting by 2030, so basically a decade away, that 80, maybe even 85% of the silver market will be required for industrial uses, which of course is mostly electrical and electronic. Well, that only leaves 15% for silver jewelry, silverware, and most important of all, silver on a monetary or an investment basis. Right. No, and while that's all going on, I mean, right now anyway, we've got the paper silver, real silver made out of real paper, well, digital, digital certificates being rehypothecated, keeping the price low. So right. how, how is that going to play out? Well, I think, you know, we just talked about it and there's going to be a squeeze. I mean, if you have industrial demand on one side and huge increasing monetary demand on the other side, it's got to squeeze it. So it's going to get to a point of where the silver community wakes up and then beyond the silver community, the general population wakes up. And that's where the real interesting times will take place. That silver is not only essential, that if I don't have it, maybe I'm not going to be able to you know, buy what I want in the future or preserve my wealth or protect my bank account or my pension fund or my retirement savings or my social security check or whatever it may be. So when that change of consciousness takes place and people realize they've been had by a system that doesn't work and has lied to them from the beginning, the run to silver or the run to gold, it'll be a run to gold and silver, will be phenomenal. It'll be off the charts. So now you're going to see a huge monetary demand for silver increase almost overnight. And then you'll see it get pushed over into the industrial side because Elon Musk isn't going to give up his business that he's built over many years because he can't get silver. So he's going to wake up and say, I need to buy a silver mine or two. I need to, first of all, stockpile some silver so I can keep the factory open for the next three months. And then on top of that, I need to secure my own supply. What's that mine over there selling for? Oh, <laughs> that doggone thing's gone up fivefold in the last eight months double the price, just like overbidding on real estate, right? That market cap of that silver mine is $2 billion. Give them four. We need the silver. We're going to buy that mine. And that will only supply half of the silver that we need. we got to find another mine to buy. So this is, you know, you could say it's an exaggeration. You can say it's rank speculation. You could say it's conjecture. You can say whatever you want. The trend is clearly there. And a trend in motion continues until it actually stops. So the trend for industrial use of silver is on the increase. And the trend for monetary silver is extremely on the increase. Last year in 2020, the amount of silver purchased was greater than the industrial demand. That's never happened in modern times. So normally, half of the silver market is industrial use. And the other half is divided between monetary demand, silverware, and silver jewelry. Last year, 2020, the industrial demand for silver was like 530 million ounces, while the industrial demand was about 500 million ounces. Right. So you mean so, the retail demand? Yeah. So if that continues this year, by the end of the year, we should be in a pretty tight place, which is very good for silver investors, meaning that the monetary demand is you know, not only increasing or continues to stay very, very strong. But more and more people are waking up to the story. I mean, you haven't done a silver interview before at Crypto Rich. Now you are. So you've got listeners come in and say, well, I don't know. That sounds too good to be true. And then they start to do their own research and they look at you know, how much silver has been mined over the last several years or the last 10 years or whatever, whatever depth they want to investigate and find out, you know, the silver supply has actually uh, been flat for the last several years. But the demand, as I keep saying, increases. So there's a lot to the silver story. I mean, if the pundits on the mainstream financial press or Wall Street or you know, out of London, uh, the great Anglo-American empire, as I like to refer to it, that does what I consider a cognitive map, as Julian Tennant said in the movie, The Four Horsemen film, once you control the thinking of people, then you've got it made. But if you let them think on their own and realize that silver's money and their fiat's phony, then they have a problem. So they have to do their best day after day to say, look at this stock, look at that stock, look at this piece of paper, look at that piece of paper, look at what this currency is doing or that currency is doing. 
very seldom hear anything about gold, although you do, and you usually get the price, especially when it's going down. And silver is a non sequitur. That sequitur, they barely ever touch the silver market, mm -hmm. and yet silver again is more important than any other element or or mineral uh, that exists, in my view. Of course, you can make cases for some of the rare earth elements for solar panels and that kind of thing, and gorilla glass. We could go there. I don't really want to. I think it's best to keep it simple. But the best place a person can uh, protect themselves right now at current price levels would be the silver market. And how much at time of recording is an ounce of silver? Right now, it's actually getting slammed as we're doing the interview. It's under 25 US. I don't know what that equates to in pounds, but it's most of us are in the US. So, okay, no. sorry. So it's uh, below 25. Be about 20 pounds. Okay, $25. Okay. Because while the silver price has been languishing for the last few years, Bitcoin has been going through the roof. Right. So why, you know, what is the utility for anybody to put their money in silver or, or gold even when they could put it in a cryptocurrency? Well, I think there's a couple of arguments. One is you really don't want everything in one basket. You know, people could do that. People have done that. And if you get it right, you look like a genius. I think you want to look over the longer term and be somewhat diversified. I mean, if the power goes out for a week or a month, you know, you could be a Bitcoin billionaire, but how are you going to transfer it? Whereas if you had some metal in your pocket, as I said, in rule number one in the 10 rules of silver investing, you would be able to you know, make a transaction. So I think it's diversification. And if you look at the long term, I mean, Bitcoin's really been around since 2009 or so, and very few people caught on to it. Uh, but gold and silver have been around for you know, four or 5,000 years. So if you look at the last 20 years of gold and silver, gold's had a compounded annual return of over 10%, and silver's had a compounded annual return of over 9%. So if you, you know, my moniker of the Morgan Report is to build and preserve wealth. Well, gold and silver have built and preserved wealth. That's their main function. But everybody's looking for that Bitcoin move. And I think it will happen, but I can't guarantee it happens. So let's say I'm wrong. And gold and silver never do a Bitcoin move, but they've done what they've done for the past two decades. They preserve your wealth. Well, if the stock market's going down and gold is going up, it's doing its job as a hedge against your other assets. Is there a place for Bitcoin? Absolutely. I'm not a huge fan of some of the cryptos, but I'm free market. And so you have to determine what's the best diversification. But let's say you swap between the two. I call the top in Bitcoin when it hits 17,000. And I just got lucky, skilled, good guest, name it whatever you want. And there was Ann, Ann Arcapoco, Jeff Berwick's uh, <clears throat> gathering that he's had year over year, which is a phenomenal event, by the way. And uh, this guy came up and he sold his Bitcoin around 17 and uh, bought silver. And then he rode the silver market up and swapped back into Bitcoin. So there's lots of options out there. <clears throat> I think Bitcoin is running into some issues. I mean, from 60, 65,000 down to 30, and now I think it's about 35 as we're doing the interview. Uh, that's pretty whack. You know, that's like silver going to 30 and going down to 15. It hit 30 this year, barely, and it's at 25. But, uh, and I'm not trying to pick on any asset class, like all markets. Let me repeat that A L L, all markets go up and down, even real estate. They all do. Okay. All right. Well, I, listen, I definitely agree with you with diversification. Definitely, definitely, definitely. I think there's value in both. Um, so in all three. And there is something about silver over Bitcoin. And I think personally over gold. And in particular, the silver Britannia. What a beautiful coin. It's a real, it, it is way more beautiful than any Bitcoin I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know you're not anti-crypto because you do talk about Bitcoin in your interviews and stuff. And you have a cryptocurrency project which is tied to silver. Um, and um, you're, you're going to come back on the channel. We're going to be talking about that to find out about that and how that ties in and how that works. Is there any last thing you want to say before we finish up, David? Or yeah, should, just, yeah, how people, if they're interested, how can they find out about you? And then how can they get into silver if they want to do that or explore it? Sure. So the uh, best way is just go to the main website, which is the themorganreport.com. Sign up for our free newsletter. I do a podcast by myself every week that wraps up the financial markets and finishes with the, the precious metals most of the time. And if you're interested in the books, there's a book tab. If you're interested in making money in the resource sector, we do more of the gold and silver, although right now we're really focused on 
gold, silver, uranium, and uh, some of the cryptos. And I call the top of the cryptos, by the way, so we're kind of building cash in that sector right now. But uh, there's a subscribe button and you can see what the premium service looks like in the mastermind service. But you don't have to be a paid member. Just get on the free list. You get plenty of free information that's very valuable. And as far as buying silver, I'm not a metals dealer. There are a couple of savings programs I can tell you about in the free newsletter. I put out the newsletter on the mailing list, uh, usually three or four times a week. Right. And I think certainly to the um, main English-speaking nations, the US, right. and Australia, the UK, um, people are able to purchase silver locally through local silver dealers and stuff, and they can check that out themselves and do their own due diligence beforehand. David, thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank, I'm thrilled to have you on my channel, by the way. Uh, I did say to David I was a little bit giddy um, having him as a guest before we started recording. And um, I look forward to speaking to you again. If anybody's watching, you know, do check out the Morgan Report. I'll have the links in the description below. In between now and when I see you next, please keep filling your pockets with Crypto Profits. This is Crypto Rich. And guess what? It's Crypto David signing out. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.